please let us know if you, if there's still some seats up front here. I think we got enough for everybody. Well, I just want to, uh, my name is Brian Shoji, I'm the general manager. Do you have a microphone? Uh, I don't have a microphone, off the yell. Can you hear, can you hear me in the back? Now. Yeah? Okay, we'll make sure we yell. <laughs> I'm Ryan Shoji. I'm the general manager of the Infrastructure Services Department of the SCRD, the Sunshine Coast Regional District. And I just want to welcome you all to the open house for our comprehensive regional water plan. And the comprehensive regional water plan is our long range uh, master water plan for the regional water system. And it's a plan that has a 25 year planning horizon. And looking at uh, where we are today, as far as our demand for the water, uh, what our capacity is today, where we need to be uh, projecting in the future, 25 years down the road, according to our land use plans, which is our OCDs, and, um, and growth, and, uh, and how we're going to get there uh, in the most sustainable manner possible. So looking at how we, uh, how we supply the future through our demand management and how we uh, plan for the future through infrastructure for expansion. So I uh, just want to thank you all for coming out on a beautiful sunny day and I'm so happy to see you all in. This is awesome. And we also have another open house happening in Gibson's uh, starting at 6.30 as well. Uh, as far as the open house structure, you'll see that there's a bunch of storyboards around the room and hopefully you have a chance to take a look at that. Uh, we're going to do a presentation which is going to take about 45 minutes, estimated. And we ask that you hold your questions to the end. It is a fairly lengthy presentation. Uh, let the uh, consultants go through the presentation and, and then uh, ask the questions at the end. And so make note of your questions as they come along. And then um, we'll have a question period. And there's myself and a few other staff members. We have uh, Marina Stepovich. Dave Crosby, who's our uh, manager of utility services, and myself, that are the answer questions. We also have our consultants who I'll introduce in a second here. And so after the question period, uh, again, we'll be here until 4 o'clock. So feel free to again pick up the storyboards, uh, find us, and hopefully you can answer your questions. And we also have a feedback form that will be at the back, and uh, we really uh, ask that you fill up those feedback forms. We'll be using that feedback as well as the questions that are asked today to uh, inform our board on any modifications that we need to be done to this draft plan. And this is a draft plan. Uh, we hope to fine tune it through your input. And um, our goal is to have the plan adopted in July. And then we, then we need to develop a business plan and a financial plan and talk about rate structures and all that. Uh, after this strategic plan is adopted. Um, and lastly, we are videotaping the uh, presentation so, um, so that we can put it up on our on the SRD YouTube channel so that people that aren't able to attend the two open houses today have a chance to view the presentation in full. And, um, and, uh, and so make it more accessible. So if you do have any concerns with yourself being on video, and I think we actually have a clear shot without any anybody's heads or anything. But if you do have any concerns, voice, video, anything with you, with you being on there, please let us know and we'll make sure that, uh, that you're not on there. And lastly, I just want to introduce our consultants. Uh, Opus, Dayton and Knight, they're a consulting firm based in, on the North Shore. And uh, Greg is going to be doing a presentation, Greg G. Sanga, he's the Vice President of Opus, Dayton and Knight. And we have uh, Clyde Young here, who's an Assistant Project Engineer and did a lot of the, a lot of the uh, technical work behind in, in this document. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Greg Jeet. And yeah, just let her finish the presentation and we'll take the questions out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming up today. It's uh, an important topic that we're talking about. <laughs> thank you all for coming out today. <laughs> So it's great to have you here. I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk in front of you. Um, we're going to talk about the Comprehensive Regional Water Plan, as Brian mentioned. Um, we'll quickly we'll go over some of the So this is a collaborative project. Um, 
We worked quite closely with a number of different teams, including the Vancouver Coastal Health. Uh, Tim Adams is here as well, in the back here. Uh, the Sunshine Coast Regional District, the District of Seashelt, the Town of Gibson, and the Seashelt Indian Government District. So it was quite collaborative. Uh, we had a couple, a number of sessions. Uh, we passed a document back to the team for comment and review uh, in preparation of the final document. So here's the agenda today. So I want to mention to you, this is a very technical document. We'll try to keep it as simple as we can for you. Um, I encourage you to ask questions when you, after the presentation, and we'll also be available afterwards um, to also take additional questions from you. Okay, so we're going to start, start with some, some of the background for the project. You know, th this is an ongoing process. Uh, we've been working with the comprehensive plan for a number of years. The last draft was out in 2002. Um, we'll be talking about some of the keys to the comprehensive plan, which include water demand and level of service. And I will explain to you what I mean by those two key items. Then we'll talk about the timelines and budgets. And then finish off with what are the next steps for the process. So as I mentioned, the last update for the plan was done in 2002. Um, we've done a number of technical memorandums since 2007. The first technical memorandum was associated with risk to your water supply at Chapman. And that looked at the risk of drought. Okay, so the second technical memorandum was to do with upgrades at your water treatment plant. We did a third technical memorandum for raising the lake, or looking at options for your Chapman Lake. And I'll get into those options today. Uh, and then the fourth technical memorandum, we looked at long-term solutions, including looking at some of the other lake supplies. And so we did look at a number of other supply options for, for the district as well. So the document, published, published it's, it relates back to the district's we envision plan and the district's corporate sustainability plan. So it's taken with that in context as well. Can you keep your voice up? I'll try. <clears throat> okay, so what is the purpose of the strategic plan? So it's an update of the 2002 plan. It assesses the current state of the regional water water supply service area. It projects the future water demands for the next 25 years and provides recommendations on how the district can meet that demand. So there's a four step process in the development of the plan. So tasks one to three, which includes an engineering analysis, which is task one. Task two is strategic planning and service level definition. And task three is 10 year capital plan. So those first three tasks have been incorporated into this document. The next step for us is to work on task number four on approved, public approval, which is uh, the business plan and rates development. So here's a slide of the regional water service area. So the regional water service area includes the Chapman service area, the Langdale area, Soames, Grantham Landing, Gibsons, and Eastbourne. Just off of Sorry, upper use, sorry. <clears throat> so the regional water service area also includes Egmont and Cope K. Okay. But 
but we exclude North Pender and South Pender in, this, in our review today. And the reason why is North Pender and South Pender are under a separate review. And the district's completing a separate 10 year master plan for those two areas. I just want to demonstrate to you the complexity of the system. So the regional water service area has about 23,000 people. There's about 10,600 service connections. 286 kilometers of water main. 16 reservoirs. 6 pump stations. And 29 PRV stations. Based on our reviews throughout the province, and this is considered a complex system for its size. I just quickly want to talk about some of the systems interconnectivity within the regional supply. So the Soames, Grantham's Landing, Hopkins, and Lango are all connected to the Chapman water supply system. Okay. And the current plan is to continue to run these systems as independent systems. And there are no plans to connect the north and south pender systems into the Chapman system. So one of the big drivers for the comprehensive plan is to, to review some of the growth projections for the district. It's actually not, not, to, to, not to review the growth projection, but to incorporate your plans for growth into our document. So what we did is we reviewed some of the historical growths for the district, and we also looked at your OCPs, which is your official community plan. And so in this, in this document today, we reference a lot back to this OCP. Okay, so your OCP growth rate is about 1.7%. This plan incorporates 2% growth rate. It has some slight conservative numbers into it, but it's in line with your official community plans. So one thing to note is when we actually review the comprehensive plan, it's an overall general review system. We don't look at specific developments. Okay, so if you have a big development going up in a certain area, that would be reviewed separately, outside of the context of this report. So this report is to look at your overall system and to look at the servicing requirements for the community. Mm -hmm. So the keys to the comprehensive regional water plan. So there's two real keys when you're looking at <coughs> plan exercise such as this. It's water demand. If your demands keep continuously increasing, you need to meet the water demands for your system. And the second is level of service. What are your, your requirements within the community for level of service? When we do our review for level of service, we, we look at a lot of typical provincial guidelines that we see throughout the province. And that's where we come up with a lot of the basis for your level of service. So water consumption within the SRD. Your water demands per average day. What we're looking at here is we, we take your total water consumption for the year. We divide it by the population and then we divide it by the number of days in the year. So it's a liters per capita per day, which is liters per person per day. Okay? And this is used commonly when you review water systems. Um, and what we've done here is we've compared you to a lot of other municipalities within BC. And the Chapman water system is about 600 liters per capita per day. The average is quite high. If you compare it across the board, it's one of the highest communities that we compare it to. And it does have some relationship to the Corporation of Delta. The Corporation of Delta also has a lot of greenhouse agricultural demands within its system. So that's an outliner within the comparison. But nonetheless, the Chapman water supply does have a high per capita flow rate. 
The second key driver for water systems is you need to look at what is your maximum day usage. So this is the maximum, highest usage day of the year. It's called maximum day demand. Okay, so that's your liters per capita per day. It's usually in the summertime. So let's take for example, theoretically it happened on July 26th. So we would look at total water use within that day divided by population. So it's liters per capita per day for that day. And your cabinet supply is usually high. You've got 1,250 liters per capita per day. Does that take into account the fact that we have a large additional summer population? Uh, I'll get into that. But it, it does take into account your, your, your population is based on your census data. On the what? On census data. But I, I will answer that. So if we, can, if we can just leave the questions to the end, that will just kind of get through this. And I will take your question. Okay, so the Chapman water system is 1,250 liters per capita per day. It's an outliner, it's quite high. Okay, if you compare that to other municipalities, it's probably blurry in the back here, but so if you compare it to, say, Nanaimo, which is about 800 liters per capita per day, it is excessively high, and you're about 20% higher than anyone else that we've compared to. 1,250 liters per capita. So, some of the options that we're looking at are to increase the demand management program that we have. So, in our document, what we do is we reference something called existing demand management, which is the program that you have today, which, is, which, which has worked quite well over the last few years, which includes you know, your toilet production program, education program that you've been doing. It has worked well. But the question that, that we ask is will it reduce your demand to a more sustainable level? And what we've come up with is some options for intensive demand management to increase your efforts for managing your water usage. And we believe that it is acceptable to target in the range of 940 liters per capita per day. Okay? And we'll get into that. Your existing demand management program includes lawn sprinkler sprinkling regulations, low flow fixture units, an education outreach program, and it also includes stage three and four water restrictions and drought periods. I will mention that your water restrictions that you had last year in stage three and four is a very unusual event to have. Okay, that is a very a, a big deal from a water perspective when you go to a stage three or stage four water restriction. So that is that is part of your current program. Pardon me. That is part of your current program. Is that program dollar? Is that five year cost? Or? This this is not five year cost. That, that, this this is the program. This is the cost to set up the program itself. Set it up. That's right. Okay, so if you look at intensive demand management, what we're talking about is universal metering. Can you look this way when you speak, please? Uh, I'll try. Here. try. Sorry. Okay. Please, my notes. Okay, so the intensive demand management program that we're proposing is universal metering, increased watering restrictions, incentive programs, and increased education and outreach. The life cycle cost of the IDM program is about 8.5 million. Sorry, of that 8.5 million, there's about a 5.6 million capital cost, which answers your question back, and a 2.86 operation and maintenance cost. So the operation and maintenance cost is for uh, the next 30 years. Okay, so here, wh why do we want to do the, why are we proposing this intensive demand management program? The, the, the usage, the water usage you have within the district affects your source capacity the most. And if you, sorry, this is, 
this is what this is what we're proposing with the two options. It's difficult for me. To, sorry, it's hard for me to read the screen itself as well. But what we're proposing with the average day demand program, if, if you continued on with the per capita that you had right now and added growth to it, you've got this blue line here for average day demand. And for maximum day demands, it's similar. We've got a similar increase in demands. <coughs> what we're proposing with the intensive demand management program is to affect your usage over the short term and to try to extend the life of your existing infrastructure for both existing and maximum day. For average day demand, we're looking at, we're proposing a 20% reduction from 600 liters per capita per day to 480 liters per capita per day. And maximum day, 25% reduction from 1,250 liters per capita per day to 940 liters per capita per day. So this is the effect uh, we also compared your average day demands to systems that had water meters. And in this slide here, what we're showing you is the city of Nanaimo is a fully metered community. The city of North Van has partial meters. And the Corporation of Delta also has partial meters. But again, you think to realize that the Corporation of Delta is there's a high agricultural water usage. And here's a comparison to uh, other metered communities as well for maximum day demands. The city of Nanaimo is metered. We've got partial metering in the city of North Vancouver. Again, partial metering with the Corporation Delta. Even with the high agricultural demands within Delta, you can see their peak day demands are a lot lower than Sunshine Coast. Okay, so the next item I want to talk about is the level of service. So what is the level of service that's required for a municipal, for a municipal organization? And what we'll do is we'll break this down. So you see all the storyboards in the back. We, we talked about the various components of your water system. What we'll do is we'll try, we'll try to make this a bit simpler. So we'll talk about the source capacity, which is Chapman Lake or the wells, depending on where you live. Treatment capacity, so you've got source, so this, so this is Chapman. Your treatment capacity is your water treatment plant. Can we talk about treatment capacity? Then we'll talk about transmission mains. This is to push water across your network. Okay, so we push water from your treatment plant across your network into reservoirs, which was another item. And then finally, to the distribution system. And I'll, I'll explain what each of these means, but this is the way that the talk is broken down. And we will try. So if you see up here in the top right hand corner, it'll show you what component of the system that we're talking about. Okay? So the source capacity. See, you have to have the ability to have sufficient volumes under certain drought conditions. Okay, so Typical municipal requirement, and it's also um, stated by the Ministry of Environment, is a one in 25 year drought. Okay, so your drought risk is currently not being met at Chapman. At Chapman Lake, your drought risk is a one in 21 year currently. And it gets worse. If you, if you don't do anything with the Chapman supply, it will get worse. And it's just because you have more demand in your system, the risk of the risk goes up because you draw more water into the lake. So what, what's the big deal at Chapman? Is you only get the top portion of the lake. And that's because of the location of the outlet for the lake. So water that's above the outlet can flow into your outlet, into your system. But there's a portion, when you drop below the outlet, the water level drops below, you run out of available water currently. So that's one, one of the issues that we'll talk about. What are the options available to you? Okay. So we looked at three options for Chapman. We looked at the engineered light, uh, a floating pump station, 
raising the Chapman Lake. And the recommendation that we came up with was a floating pump station or an alternate to access the lower reaches of the lake. Okay. You, right now, you're only accessing about 20% of that lake volume. So 80% of that lake volume is below the element of the lake. So these are the options that we're looking at. You can either lower that intake somehow, put in a pump station to pump water out of the lake, or look at other options. Try to raise it lake level itself, and the other one was a man-made lake. So it's basically to convert a gravel quarry into a lake. The gravel quarry is currently in operation. So the long-term recommendation is for an engineering lake, is to look at that gravel quarry option or groundwater. There are some concerns with groundwater because there's never been a major groundwater source found other than the one that's close to Gibson's. And the concern with the Gibson's aquifer is you will be taken away from some of the aquifer providing water to Gibson's as well. <coughs> so the engineered lake option has savings if you did do the intensive demand management program. And that's just because the volume required, as you increase your, your demands within the system, there's less volume required. Okay? So there's about a $3.25 million savings for the engineered lake and a $700,000 late day, $700,000 savings for the floating pump station with that option. And we also look at small systems capacity. We did not carry out a drought risk analysis. The small systems are groundwater based. And it's much more difficult to do drought risk analysis on a, on a groundwater base, on a groundwater source, okay? And that's just to do with the aquifer recharge, the amount of data that you need. So we did not have the data to do a, a detailed drought risk analysis for the groundwater source. The current capacities. Yes. I don't know if there's anybody here from Egmont or Earl's Cove, because those are actually surface water systems. Sorry, that's right. Don't, don't want to. Uh, uh, yeah, Earl, Egmont is also surface water. It's from Wally, and um, Earl's Cove is from Virginia. So we do have two small systems that we have based on. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. So, the, the, so for the small source, small systems, the current capacities are able to supply to maximum day demands. And you're also able to meet the 2036 demands in all of your small systems, with the exception of Eastbourne systems. So Eastbourne has an ongoing issue with capacity. Uh, the Eastbourne wells have limited capacity, and there is a, a groundwater investigation program that's recommended to find additional wells for that area. Okay, so the next item we're going to be talking about is your water treatment plant. So we talked about source, going over to water treatment, treatment capacity. So that's the ability of the system to provide treated water during maximum day demand. So you have to be able to provide that much water during maximum day demand, because that's the way your system is. That's how all municipal systems are set up, okay? So you have to be able to replenish your reservoirs over a one day period. If you're unable to do that, what will happen is the reservoir levels start to drop off over subsequent days. You're not able to recoup the reservoirs. And those are the tanks on the outside of your system. If you aren't able to recoup those reservoirs, it causes a problem. So the water treatment plant on municipal systems are usually sized to maximum day demand. Your water treatment plant is at capacity and has been at capacity for the last couple of years. So the capacity of your plant is 25 megaliters per day. You're running slightly above capacity today. And what we're saying is if you do nothing, if you do not do a demand attempt to increase the demand management of your system, you will need some significant upgrades to your plant today. Okay? What we're proposing to do is under intensive demand management, if you 
brought your per capita usage down, you could, you could actually keep your existing plan until about 2020, after which you do need upgrades to your system. Okay, so the current capacity is mentioning is 25 megaliters per day. Under existing demand management, the required treatment capacity is about 45 liters, megaliters per day, a capital cost of 10 million. Under intensive demand management, your treatment capacity required would be 37.5 megaliters per day at a capital cost of 6.4 million. So we also looked at small systems as well. And we looked at your Langdale, Soames Point, Brampton Plant, and Coke Gate all have fluoridation only. Those are all your groundwater sources. Uh, at Aquan and Coke Gate, you've got UV and fluoridation. As Brian mentioned, those are two uh, lake supplies. <coughs> and you have filtration, UV, and, chlor and fluoridation at Chapman and Exporting sites. Okay. We found that the treatment capacities are able to meet 2011 demands. And treatment capacities will be able to meet 2036 maximum day demands as well. The recommendations include automation of chlorination of chlorination facility at Soames Well and expansion of treatment at the Eastbourne Wells if more wells are dug. And then complete source tap assessments and well protection plans. So the next item with the transmission mains is to push water out to your reservoirs. Uh, you do have unique characteristics within your system. It's a skating long system. It causes issues with uh, friction losses as you push water across the network. So the system, again, has to have the ability to refill your reservoirs within 24 hours. So we found that transmission mains are adequately sized, adequately sized to refill the system reservoirs under 2011 maximum day demands. And will require upgrades in the 2036 maximum day condition and under both existing demand management and intensive demand management. So this is a slide just to show you some of the transmission mains. So the way to think about this is if you're in your house and you're taking a shower and Somebody else starts using the water, the pressure drops. Okay? So that pressure drop is because of friction. It's, it's common, it's the same principle here. You get more water flowing out, you get more friction losses as you go out with your system. Okay, so this is the current 2011 system. Current, current 2011 condition. Okay, so in your system, You've got a pump station here, it's called Roberts Creek Pump Station. So what it does is it adds energy as you move east. And then what the goal of the system is, is to provide water to re-road reservoirs and cemetery reservoirs. You have to get water to these points. And as well, you need to get water out to the Secret Cove Reservoir to the west. What happens is, in 2036, if you're not able to fill the reservoirs, you just can't get water out that far. So it's like, it's like having a hose. Uh, what you do to increase pressure, you get a bigger hose. Okay, so that, that's similar to what we're proposing here. Or you can, add, you can build pumps as well. So it's a combination of the two. You can put bigger pipes along with upgrades to your pump stations. Okay, so there's that explains the transmission means it's a complicated subject uh, it's tough to get into every transmission main upgrade in a form like this but the summary is that there are cost differences with the two management programs so if you look at the existing demand management it's about 7.5 million in transmission main upgrades intensive demand management about 2.1 million Savings about 5.5 million. 
And this is all because of the bigger pipes and bigger pump stations that are required if you've got more flow. And it's really, and your system is sensitive because it's so long and skinny. Okay, the next item we'll talk about is the Chapman the reservoirs capacities. So those are the tanks at the at various points within your system. So again, to, to summarize, so you have the water source, which is the Chapman Lake in general, or wells. You've got your water treatment plant, which is water to transmission mains to push it out. And then you, you do is you look at your reservoir. Okay, so this is the tanks. So you have to have the ability to balance and, and optimize supply and delivery of water to the end users. So the current balancing and fire storage are out of bed. Okay, so the tanks themselves are used for a number of different things. So if you're only pumping maximum day in your source, if you go beyond that capacity, and you do throughout the day, and you do, you will actually increase beyond the capacity, you supplement the system by using drawing water from reservoirs. So it's something called balancing storage. Okay? So whenever you go above maximum day, you use the reservoirs to balance it. The reservoirs are also used for fire protection. The system is designed to maximum day comes from your treatment plant, and balancing storage and fire protection come from these reservoirs. Okay, so that's what we look at when we do the reservoir capacity analysis. So the current and fire storage volumes are considered accurate, uh, adequate. Um, the, the, you have quite a large tank at the Clearwell, which is at the water treatment plant. And that allows for a lot of redundancy with the new system. Okay, so there are savings with the two programs as well. So the existing demand management is about $1.5 million in upgrades requirement required. And the intensive demand management, there are no upgrades required in the reservoirs. We also looked at the small system reservoirs as well. Uh, the current reservoir capacities are adequate for balancing and fire storage within those systems. Uh, there are some future fire storage deficiencies in the Langdale, Solms Point, and Grantham Mining systems, but that can be managed via the existing interconnections of the Chapman water system. That's when you utilize some of the interconnection with your Chapman supply system. So there are some recommendations um, with that interconnection. So fire storage is relied on through the interconnection to other systems, the Fisher PRB and closed valves and between each of the Langdale, Solms Point, Grantham's Land and Chapman water system should be checked on a regular basis. So you want to make sure if you're going to rely on the Chapman system for those small areas that you have a, a robust connection with the Chapman system. Okay, so the final level here is the distribution system. So this is when you get down to the house, house level itself. Okay, so when you get water from the reservoir, provide water from there to residents, you're looking at the distribution system. So this is the, these are the smaller pipes that come into neighborhoods. So some of the defined requirements, level of service requirements when we do analysis on this type of system is a pressure requirement. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to have at least 40 psi pressure during maximum day demand. And you have to have a certain back pressure when you have fire protection. Okay, so you want to have at least 20 psi when you fight fires. And that's just an issue with uh, back flow within the system and certain pressure that, that, that you want to keep maintained within your system under that condition. So we look at the fire flow requirements of the district. <clears throat> what we're recommending is a 60 liter per second fire flow requirement in urban areas and a reduced fire flow requirement in rural areas. This is quite common within BC. Um, and we did um, do a technical memorandum to review the two options as well. Uh, the cost to update the, system, the entire system to 60 liters per second is an additional $7 million. So that was a, a factor as well. Okay, so 
I won't go into all the distribution upgrades. There is a poster in the back about some of the distribution system upgrades. Uh, I will answer questions about this if you like. I won't talk too much in detail. Uh, but there are a number of distribution system upgrades required on the west and east sides of the regional district. Okay, so the thing to note when you get a distribution system, uh, the costs for upgrades in those systems are fairly close under both, both programs. So under existing demand management, the cost is about 10.5 million. Under intensive demand management, about 9.6 million. And that's the savings of about $900,000. Okay, one of the other areas that we looked at was maximum serviceable areas. Okay, so this, these are uh, current pressure zones. Current pressure zones within your system. Okay, so what happens in your system is, especially in a water system, is you can't have the entire system into one pressure zone. The energy within that zone, uh, you can't have it at a certain elevation. So we look at something called an energy grade line. Okay, so that's the, the amount of energy that water has within the zone. And the problem is, is, as you go down in elevation, that energy turns into pressure. And you can't have too high of a pressure within your system. Okay, so you have to have multiple zones. And that, and that's, that's basically what happens in the Sunshine Coast. It happens in all water systems. You have, you have zones, it's water zones, okay? And the, and the same thing happens in reverse. As you go up the hill, you need to add energy. So what you'll do is you'll switch zones as you go up the hill. Okay, so you've got the zone, I think one, when somebody asked me a question, what's zone one and zone two? So within your system, zone one is closer to the water, because it's lower elevation. As you go up the hill, you go into something called zone two. And you've got subsequent zones throughout various parts of, of, of the regional mm -hmm. district. I won't go into every one, but that's the concept. Okay, so that's common for water systems. So what we looked at is, the maximum serviceable area within your existing zones. Okay, so this, that's what this map here shows. So we've got zone one, which is the blue line. And then we have zone two, which is this green shaded area. Okay, so if you look at your existing um, pressure zones, this is the maximum serviceable area. This is the elevation which that zone can accommodate development. Okay, if you look at the east, eastern portion, it's very similar. You've got the blue zone, which is zone one, and as you go up the hill, you get to this green zone, which is zone two. And when you go further east, you've got upper zones as well. So it's, you're, going high, you're going to higher elevations. So these are existing zones. Again, we're just looking at the maximum serviceable area in those zones. Gurji, one of the things with this is what we want to show is there are properties that are developed that have homes on them that are higher than our top pressure zones. So that this is the reason why we can't get water to some of the upper areas in West Sea Shell and, and, uh, and Robert Street. Okay, so we also looked at the uh, small systems distribution system. Um, so this is not presented in any priority order, but the thing to recognize here is the cost was the same for both um, existing and intensive demand management. Both, both uh, when you look at both the scenarios, it was very similar in terms of the upgrades that were, were required for the small systems. Okay, so here's a cost summary of the two options that we're, we're looking at. So on the left hand side, you have existing demand management. What is that possible? About 43 million. Intensive demand management, life cycle possible, about 36 million. So the program itself, which which is um, coincides with your uh, sustainability plans is also reinforced by the cost savings. Project timeline and budget. 
So preliminary 10-year capital plan is prepared. Timeline will be finalized as financial plan and business plan are prepared. Okay, so here's here are the next steps. Um, so we've got May 15th, it's public feedback period closes. June 6th, consultation report to SCRD Infrastructure Services Committee. In June, we've got a corporate feedback into the CRWP, which is plan. July, we want to finalize the plan to IS, ISC for adoption. In July to August is to prepare business and financial plans. And in September is to present financial plan and rate structures to ISC. Metro Vancouver right now is going to stage one water restriction, which only allows you to water in the mornings. Between I think four and four and eight in the morning. And that's it, three days a week. That's stage one. And that, that's an inconvenience. You talk about you know trying to water wait, setting an alarm clock to go water in a lot. But that's stage one. It just it shows you though when you went to stage two within the district, it was quite a considerable impact. You went from like some of the <laughs> between 1,100 liters per capita per day down to 850, significant. So it, it just goes to show you that you do use quite a bit of water within the region. Could you go back to the previous slide, please, Captain? How long did the uh, report take to deliver? Well, we had a lot of start from stopping going on just because of uh, competing um, projects. Um, so it's, it's pretty hard to say exactly how long it took. Basically, we started the project five years ago. But not to say it took five years to develop a plan. It's just the solid waste management plan came in there and a few other things. So. My concern is, is uh, I'm given two weeks to absorb all this. And 
and uh, there seems to be some urgency in this uh, in this schedule. Yeah. Uh, those dates are selected to work backwards, essentially. What we want to do is try to get information in here that has a monetary impact into the budget process, and the budget starts at the end of the year. Uh, we wanted to get essentially have the rate structures and the impacts of the rates uh, to our board in September. So just working backwards, it kind of came to this. And this is the feedback we want to know. If you feel that there's not enough time to provide your feedback, if you feel that there's uh, the thing is with this document, we realize this is a very technical document, so there is a lot to absorb. So please, if you feel that the timeline is too tight, uh, we'll take that forward to our board and see if we can stretch it out. Uh, in, in the early part, you talked about the intensive management portion, and one of the aspects was meter of the water. And you mentioned, I believe, about eight and a half million dollars for the, uh, the capital cost. Did that include the cost of the meters, or are the cost of the meters uh, the responsibility of the water users? Yeah, that, 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 is, that includes the meters, includes the installation. And I don't know if you explained it, Richie, but uh, all those figures, that's the life cycle cost. So that includes not just the capital, but also includes the operating cost over a 25 year period. So that's uh, capital. So, yes, to answer your question, it includes the supply of the meter, the installation of the meter, and actually running the program. Can I just comment on it? Uh, several years ago, Calgary did the same thing while we were there. And they installed the meters and noticed a, a reduction in water usage of an excessive 20%. So I think the forecasts you're making look very reasonable on the basis of what others have experienced. Good. Thank you. you uh, considered uh, the existing and uh, intensive water management plans, and I read about the costing on that, it's very interesting. However, I would like to see costing on a third option, which is uh, stopping all cosmetic watering. What would happen if that, that would mean um, you could still water your, your uh, vegetable garden, um, clean your car, whatever, but no, no watering of lawns and flower beds? What would be the cost difference to that third option? Actually, our, uh, our colleague in the back there said, asked if I could repeat the question so they were going to be here. Um, yeah, so the question I think is uh, uh, we considered eliminating cosmetic use of water uh, mm -hmm. in the summertime. So, no, no water of uh, lawns. Lawns and flowers. Uh, we are running. A parallel process on our growth management plan, and uh, we are we're going to be announcing actually a, a survey on uh, changes to our growth management plan. So changes to our stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four sprinkling restrictions. So these these are questions that we will be asking in this plan. No, we have uh, basically just looked at decreasing demand. We weren't very specific on how, other than metering, on how we do that. But metering itself, you know, as this gentleman said, uh, other communities have experienced just by putting meters in that the demand's gone down by 20%. Just because the consumers, people using the water, know and can actually manage their own consumption. Plus, the other big thing is uh, we find leaks in the system that. And actually, Egmont is a, a, an excellent example. We just commissioned the Egmont water system. Uh, we started hooking up everybody to the system, and we found the consumption was huge. And I, essentially, half the consumption was coming from one connection that had a So, um, I'll, I'll go to you. There are two or three short questions, if I may. You mentioned leakage. I think it was specific um, to Egmont, but 
What proportion of the capacity is lost now within the lower coast here through leakage and what effort is made to detect and rectify that? Secondly, you mentioned metering and it's being installed now in new developments. Um, how are the meters read? Are they going to be radio controlled or are they just manual, old fashioned, electromechanical? And the third one, when there's a large residential development, as we are here, Sangara's development, ultimately 2,300 homes, is there no storage capacity there? They just fell off the mains, there's no uh, excuse me, storage facility for a large residential development? Three questions there. Uh, first one was on, I'm sorry, leakage. On leakage. Uh, challenge with trying to do a, a, a water saver survey right now is we don't have the data. Uh, so meters is definitely going to help us locate leaks. Our, currently, we just uh, find leaks on mains through. Uh, when you actually see the water bubbling up to the surface because our, our mains are under high pressure. The problem is the majority of the leakage is on the surface connections. It's on the run from the main to, the, to your house. So with universal metering, we'll be able to read all the meters and find out where the high consumption is and get the information to, uh, to the households say, you know, your system is, is uh, a very high consumer. We don't know really if it's because you do use a lot of water or whether it's leak, but it will give uh, everybody the opportunity to figure out where that, where that water's going. And we'll be able to, and we also be able to uh, determine leaks in our mains as well, uh, but not uh, more readily through meter. Technology uh, that hasn't been decided, it has been, uh, there, the, uh, we have, we are going to radio rain technology in North and South Pender. Uh, how we rolled out that program has been undecided yet. We don't know the type of technology. There's different types of radio reef. There's some radio reef systems where the meter is dormant until you drive by and it wakes up, sends the message out, and then goes back to sleep. But, um, and then there's others that do send out a signal on a regular basis. All the meters will be at property line. They won't be in your homes. But, uh, so north and south Canada, yes, it is real read. The rest of the system, that question hasn't been asked yet. And we haven't designed a program, so whether there's going to be an opt-out uh, um, option as well, and that's more, more likely than, than not, not likely. And uh, the last question, sorry. But just before you leave that one, you're installing all the meters right now. Are they electromechanical or are they... They're touchpad. The ones that we're installing right now, you actually have to physically touch them. Okay. The last question is why don't you put storage capacity when there's a large residential development, as there's quite a few in West Seashell, there's no storage capacity, is there? Yeah, and Gerd, you could answer that one, because it's not, our reservoirs aren't designed for community, it's designed on the whole system. And the other thing is, when you build reservoirs within zones, the zone thing. so if you had zone one, the reservoirs in zone one all have to be at the same elevation. If they're not at the same elevation, it causes a lot of operational issues. So it's a question of the elevation within that area as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that also plays into it. Okay. Thank you. Two questions. What specific research has, happened, has happened to date to try to isolate why there seems to be an anomaly on the coast for how much water consumption that we have? But you're basing it on volume of usage and you're saying that when we do have restrictions like in the summertime, you notice a big difference. Other than that, what other research to try to identify why we are so different here with our water usage and where it might be located? And the other question that you were saying with the reservoir um, Chapman Creek or, or the lake, it only accesses um, the first 20% of volume in the lake because of where the outflow is located. Um, what is the reason that outflow is located at that particular height to do in rel relativity to the lake? And is that a feasible thing to change or lower it or not? Um, as far as uh, getting a better understanding of our water consumption on the coast, um, you know, metering, we don't have the data. But we have, uh, we, we do know that the water consumption doubles in the summertime. And the, the doubles in the summertime, not because you're 
using more water inside the house is because they're using water outside the house. So, but as far as market research uh, or, or social marketing, no, we haven't uh, done a lot of survey work on how you consume, how it's how consumed. Um, but that's what metering will do. It will all give us that information that we are lacking. And the lake itself, uh, right now we only, we only draw from the top 10 feet of the lake. And the lake's, lake's over 100 feet deep. So, so we only draw from the top 10. And when they built that structure, uh, actually those days, back in the 70s, that was deemed a lot, enough water. And now uh, population's grown quite a bit since then. And we need more capacity. I would have loved it if they, did, if they built it uh, another 10 feet deeper. So, so is that something that can be changed and dropped down? Yeah, it's bedrock, so we are looking at alternatives. One alternative that uh, they hope this and I did look at was a floating pump station. And um, so the, the pump would kind of go up and down. The <laughs> and we are looking at other, we have a commission and engineering study to look at see if there's other ways that, are, that we can access that through gravity whether it's a tunneling into the bedrock to get to lower reaches or whether it's blasting out a channel, that's always now another option. Yeah, but the biggest, the biggest issue at Chapman is it's your primary drinking water source. So if you do construction in the lake, you have to be really careful about contamination. So if you do blasting or drilling or anything like that, like the, the safety measures that you have to put into place Enormous, right? You, you have to be really careful about that. So that's our concern when we look at options like blasting out bedrock. Um, we, we don't want any risk, especially when it comes to it's such a significant source of drinking water. So that, that, is, that is an issue that we're looking at. Um, so that's why we looked a lot harder at the, the flowing pump station because of the risk associated with some of the other options. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have uh, two points, and I won't ask you to respond to them all now, but um, <clears throat> before I go on to the other ones, I have a, a quick question. Why is Great Creek not involved in this, this study? I like think that's part of our primary water system. Uh, Great Creek, with, uh, it just, it, first it has no treatment. It just has uh, chlorination, and it's a surface water, so it doesn't need the deep water guidelines to use as a major source. We do use it as a backup uh, in the summertime for the aquatic uh, <coughs> area, but um, and it doesn't have a lot of volume that we need it the most, which is in the summertime. So we don't have the capacity, it doesn't have the proper level of treatment, and the cost to develop that would be significantly higher than putting the money into charity. It still should be part of this. System should end up you're, you've identified all the other parts of the system, and it is used in, in part in the summertime. So it seems like it should at least. And, and apologies, it was actually included. I didn't, I didn't mention it today, but we did actually do some work with reviewing that. We talked a lot with Ricky Water Officer as well. Uh, what happens is, yeah, if, if you ever did use Gray Creek water, you can't let it go back into the main part of the Chapman supply. It can only go to Sandy Hook Pump Station and not further. And that's a requirement from the drinking water officer. Yep. So that is that is one of the limitations limitations for Green Creek Creek itself. Uh, it is mentioned as an emergency backup supply. Uh, as Brian mentioned, yeah, it does have problems with water quality, uh, the treatment requirements. Uh, the water also gets turbid, so it has discoloration at certain points of the year. And it's just it's an issue with, with that source specifically. The other emergency backup supply you have is Trout Lake, which I didn't mention. Uh, it's a very small source. It does not have a big capacity to your system. Uh, it is connected, but it's not used. It's, it's still there for emergency water supply. So th those are the two. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention those. Yeah, and it is in the document. Okay. Uh, just some quick, quick points. I, I really uh, think it's important that you do move forward on, on, on metering. It just seems to be totally sensible to me. I have seen no, no argument whatsoever, other than it's going to cost us money, which is an argument. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, and improving the Chapman Reservoir uh, capacity, uh, the treatment capacity seems to make sense. Um, creating the, the man-made lake 
really resonates with me because um, um, it's not just up to engineers to, to decide what happens to Chapman Lake. It's, it's uh, the, the statutory decision maker in there happens to be the, the BC Park system. And in, on Sunshine Coast, we have less parks, less biodiversity protection than any place else in British Columbia. We only have less than 3% of our ecosystems that are protected. So, so messing around with Chapman Lake is something that we have to be very, not just for, for the reason that you pointed out, which make a lot of sense to me, but we have to be extremely careful because putting floating pumps on, on that system, uh, A, it's going to interfere with the, the natural, you know, the noise and all the rest of it, and the servicing is going to interfere with that, that natural system. B, it's going to be a fossil fuel uh, involved and, and structures that have to be built inside our very small uh, natural uh, ecosystems that, that we have left here. So it's something that if we can avoid that by any means, then let's do it. So creating that, that, that man-made reservoir at, at the, the ground pit seems to make a, a ton of sense in, in comparison to that. And I, I, I guess I'm putting my five cents in to, to, to do that. Um, I don't see why, back to that, I thought that was a good comment about, about uh, uh, watering lawns. It's time for the, I guess the politicians maybe on the Sunshine Coast to show a little backbone and just simply say no to sprinkling our, our, our water systems. If we, let's use that, I mean, it's just cosmetic. They, uh, in, in the fall, they, the, uh, uh, the grass grows back again and it's nice and green for, for three quarters of the year. So let's, we're not playing Dick and Jane here uh, with, with some nice little little little, little um, uh, green lawn scenario. Uh, um, so let's use what th that summer water for, for gardens, which makes a whole lot of sense, rather than, than, than a cosmetic. So I think it's, it may not be you gentlemen who have that, that pen. I think it's probably a, 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 a political decision that has to be made, and people seem to be afraid of offending Somebody want those Dick and Jane lawns, so I suggest. Yeah, of course, it's another story. So, um, last point is is uh, the uh, Sunshine Coast Conservation Association has got their. I, I don't know if you've done anything and looked at their their plans that they put forward in terms of home water storage capacity, but I think that's something else that should be incorporated in this because I, I would suggest that, that looking at at, uh, at at some means of supporting. The development of that, like like regional district, a great amount of foresight did with, with uh, our our toilets and and, and uh, uh, low pressure uh, faucets in our homes. So I think that's the kind of thing that would, would help as well. Thank you. <coughs> was, there, was there a question in there? Yes. Um, my question is this: uh, it's all about money. Let's face it, we, we need more water. And we have to look ahead to that young generation that's coming up. There's going to be 50 or 80,000 people living here in about 25, 30 years. So we have to really look ahead. But my question really is this. Will the regional district be eligible for federal government and provincial government grant capital grants to help the uh, residents of Sunshine Coast pay for this needed uh, change to increase our water supply. Uh, we've been applying for a uh, federal provincial grant for a medium program for at least uh, nine years. Um, and fundamentally, the senior government grants, they won't fund growth projects, so anything that has built more capacity to support growth, but they will fund uh, water quality improvements and things like that. But anything tied to growth, typically they won't fund. Um, we'll continue to apply for grants as they come along, and actually I met with uh, a bunch of the provincial uh, grant people just last week uh, talking about different ways that we can fund uh, some, some, especially the medium program, which is uh, one of our main ticket items. So, um, but no, we probably won't get any grants for growth. And um, the medium program 
myself, and actually, if you, if you are curious about financial asterisks, those two boards show the 10-year uh, capital plans under what the existing demand management program and, exist, and intensive demand management program. And you'll see that even with metering, even though it's a high capital cost up front, we are saving money. It won't cost us less over the next 10 years and even more so over the next 25 years if we need to do a meeting for them now. Is this somebody else first? Uh, yeah. Will we be allowed to collect data on the group? Yeah, actually, uh, that's what yeah. George Smith was talking about. Three water harvesting. What was the question? Can we uh, collect rainwater on our roofs? And uh, uh, Sunshine Coast Conservation Association has a wonderful yes. document on well, rainwater harvesting. That's not going to be banned as it is in Sunshine It's a public health uh, uh, issue. It's not something that we uh, regulate. Okay. Um, I think through the through the building, actually, our building inspectors might have Well, I mean, uh, I mean uh, collecting water from the roof and storing it uh, and then uh, using it in the summer to, for watering. Uh, not lawns, I think lawns are the most wasteful kind of use of land that anyone can imagine, but for watering vegetables or, or even flowers, well, some definitely. special flowers. Definitely uh, the, old, the cistern system for collecting rainwater and using it for outdoor use and is uh, definitely permitted. Okay. It's, uh, concern is when you try to bring it in and plumb it into your house. Oh, no. And the other thing is, can we, uh, if we have a lot of groundwater on our property, can we dig a well for that purpose of using outside? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I believe uh, I'll have to talk to our, our planning people, but uh, right now, uh, wells, uh, you don't have to get a, a uh, you just step uh, down. Uh, I'm not familiar with the permitting requirements for wells, uh, just to use for irrigation. Well, if the, the groundwater is actually in a very wet area anyway, so, you know, the groundwater is there most of the year. In a very, very dry, uh, you, you can dig down two feet and get water. Yeah. And Sharon, drinking water officers just came back in. What is the permitting process if you want to dig a well in your on your property to use for irrigation purposes? Uh, most places, most properties in Sunshine Coast are serviced by. You're talking about properties that are already serviced by the regional water supply. Uh, you have to have setbacks from your existing septic field if you're on septic. It's under eight minimum. Uh, there is no formal permitting procedure, and that would be through an industry environment for individual wells on the property. So you have to have, uh, just observe all the setback requirements. I'm not sure what the position of the regional district and how the well that's served by the Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I can you guys meet with? I'm not sure what the regional district uh, uh, requirements are for, uh, for putting wells on properties that are serviced by water. I don't know. Um, okay, um, I like the cosmetic painting, cosmetic watering idea. I think that's uh, a good way to restrict like unnecessary use of water. Um, I was wondering if you had a, a amount of population that was above the elevation of Chapman Creek, so that it wouldn't be able to be serviced by the existing Chapman Creek. I see. Uh, that's on my list of things to do. Um, somebody posed that question. We don't have population right now. And um, I was wondering about the water rate. So once people have to start paying, if uh, industrial people are going to have to pay more than, say, someone who's growing a garden, and how, like, if someone's, you know, I think there should be a clear definition between cosmetic watering and someone, like, a young family who has a mortgage and trying to water a garden to feed their family, as well as, like, some kind of subsidy for local food production. Um, that would be nice to see. In the plan, and also um, about rainwater collection. I know, like some of the new developments um, through the green building programs, uh, collect a large amount of rainwater to be stored for fires and for like the 
but as development continues in the future, I would think that would be something that the, the district of Sea Shelter should be looking at. So they'll probably take can take a few from you guys. And uh, thank you. Brian, uh, has anybody done any projections on the impact on household costs? To do this pro capital program? No. What we want to do. Oh, sorry. Uh, have we done an analysis on what the impact of this capital program will be on, on your consumer rates, basically? And we haven't done that yet because what we want to do is get agreement on the strategy. Like, do we want to do an intensive demand management program? Do we want to do the metering, uh, which will delay our treatment plan? Uh, do we want to do the the work up at Chapman versus uh, <laughs> building uh, a man-made lake, an engineer lake right away. So we want to get those questions answered before we start doing an in-depth analysis on on policy and impact of ways. I had a on the end that you received from the consumer. Yeah, some of those chicken and eggs uh, things. We want to get a, a good idea of the strategy. And uh, what we're looking at as far as the rate structure is basically there's only three ways to uh, collect to pay for this. There's Parcel taxes, user fees, and development cost rates. So, um, uh, so what's the impact going to be on those three? And we're not, we don't know. Yet. Brian, what's the capital cost for the floating pump station and versus the engineer lake? What's the capital cost for those two options? For you. <laughs> I think it's seven yeah. for the uh, floating pump station and ten million for the mm -hmm. Floating pump station. If we have the intention of the Man Management Program, it's six hundred and sixty thousand versus uh, four and a half million for the engineer. Okay. And yeah, and, and the key it's it's the combination. There's basically three options. There's uh, and we're just talking about the floating pump station as an interim measure. We ultimately we want to replace that with an engineer. Um, and it's how we're going to be managed, how do we manage the droughts, periods, until that infrastructure is built. And um, a lot of it is uh, through restrictions on outdoor water use. And we have shown last year, we were able to decrease, and it's great, the community really um, kicked in when we faced that drought. You know, water consumption was cut in half. And actually, we were consuming in, in October when the drought was through three months of drought, we were consuming less water then than we do normally during the wet season. So we know it can be done. When you uh, you mentioned that the quarry is in it's a possible site, is that about halfway down the down the creek? Halfway down the creek? It's still it, it'll be above the water treatment plant. No, I'm not. Is it okay? Anyway, I, I would kind of scope that out. But you also said that it's in use right now. When is, so that's a controlling factor. So I'm, pre I'm presuming you know when they anticipate having fully exploited that gravel source. Yeah, we've just entered into discussions with uh, Lehigh about their site. We've kind of also been talking to other uh, mining operations in the area. Uh, so nothing, we don't have anything solid yet. So they haven't told you when they'll be finished? And all the, their site is, we got different years all throughout the site. So we're trying to find an area right now that has already been mined, that they deem doesn't have this much value anymore. And there's nothing to say, we haven't started talking prices or anything, because you could actually buy, get the rights over an area that has been mined, just have to pay the mining rate. So we haven't, we haven't been into, into detailed discussions yet. I was wondering, to what extent do the long-range plans effects of uh, climate change are expected to have on our water supply? Uh, there is a section in the document, it's section 5, that speaks to climate change. 
Um, and it will have an impact. Essentially, uh, we, we cite a bunch of studies that have been done on the impact of climate change on water systems. But the doctrine itself is pretty general. It uh, specifies that, that it's going to lead to longer, drier summers and um, um, more intense storms in, in wintertime. So hard to get the higher potential for landslides, things like that. So it does speak to that, and uh, whether it's climate change, climate variability, high consumption, uh, the same solution for all of those risks is build more capacity into your system so you can ride out those longer summers. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't say that we're going to be dry all year round. There's, there's no predicting that we're going to have wet winters. So, as you're probably aware, we're spilling over the dam crest nine months of the year. So, it's just a matter of capturing some more of that water during the winter time so we have it when we need it in the, in the summer and, and those prolonged growing weeks. Is that? We have a couple of questions. Well, one question is the second one. Do you have a cost for this in the lake? Cost for Andrew Lake? The Andrew Lake shows uh, four and a half million under the intention of the Dam Management Program. No, it's that. And that seven and a half for the existing. Is that four and a half million to secure the land for the lake plus the building of That's just the capital construction. That doesn't include land costs. So if you're looking at Andrew Lake, four and a half million dollars, when you just put a desalination plant, which will do the same thing for less cost. And you don't have that as part of one of your options. Uh, the problem with the nation is the energy. High energy costs. If you're here to leave, you have to pull on the water comes out of the air. You put all that water sitting up there. You can, you'll run out of water in front of the air before you run out of water in the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing about, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I could argue the point that desalination, the capital cost of desalination plants is where you see that. You don't see desalination plants, especially in Canada. You'll see them in areas where, where the water, water costs quite high. But, 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 but you know, there's, there's two problems with the desalination plant. One, capital cost. Number two, the cost to operate the facility. It's, it's, it's much more labor intensive. The cost for treatment is much higher. And so your production costs are a lot higher than desalination. So it's, a, it's an option that you won't really see on the West Coast. It's just not feasible. I find that hard to believe. I, I, I don't know the numbers, but I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, and almost every island is supplied by desalinated water. And these are countries that have an income for capital income less than 40% of what we have here. So how can they afford to do it and we can't? <laughs> it's, it's again like you, you just don't see the desalination plants on the West Coast. It's, it's a question of water source. What, what are the options that they have compared to what you have, right? So, I mean, I, we haven't gone into details about desalination plant options, but that is an issue. You just don't see them. And that's what the driving factor is the cost, the cost of water and your other options. Five years ago, you didn't see uh, factory power players I didn't. Well, they are high capital costs. They're high, they're very energy intensive, so a high operating cost. And then they're built at the ocean level, so you have to pump that water back up to your reservoir as well. So it's, uh, we, we got, we're, we're very fortunate we live on the wet coast, and we have a lot of rain still, mm -hmm. even, even after uh, 150 years of climate change. What's the proposed means of powering the floating pump station in the lake? Uh, we're proposing, uh, uh, we haven't gone into details uh, design, but we're proposing propane. Okay. Yeah, we uh, propane over diesel, definitely. Yeah. I'd like to address the, uh, the option you have of raising the level of check light. Uh, that's a pretty the riparian areas in that ecosystem are the most valuable areas uh, for life that, that exist. And doing that would just start a domino through. If you did it now, it would be okay 
for it to happen after the next 25 years. The next 25 years. Pretty soon all your lowland areas in that mountain alpine lake system up there would be flooded up. And uh, I really object to that. I think it's short sighted because it's, the, it's a jewel. <laughs> the, you know, the question is uh, the raising the down height and flooding more area at Chapman Lake. And it was looked at just to do the cost comparison, but it hasn't been pursued and it's not I was wondering a little bit about the deforestation and if that, uh, if you guys studied all that effect on how fast the reservoir traffic makes those We're very fortunate and it doesn't have to do with deforestation or anything. The, most of the Chapman watershed is in the Chapman region uh, part, so it's protected. Uh, the lower regions have come down the creek, like the lake itself is. And it's, uh, it's very, it's bedrock. And one thing that may not be common knowledge, when we had that severe drought, we got down to that 10 foot level and we were at zero. Uh, that lake was full after five days of rain. So it recovers very quick and we're very, very fortunate. And you attribute most of that to the fact that the headwaters aren't protected? No, it's just because it's bedrock. So everything that falls just runs into the lake. It's, uh, we're very fortunate. Some, some areas of mountain lakes take a whole year to recover. Ours took five days. This is amazing. You mentioned there was some uh, average or map issues, but you also mentioned that there would be south of Seychelles. I you know that there's springs. They're just, um, just north of Seychelles, and they're the, you know, the high school, the groundwater is really high. I know there's a problem with arsenic further up, but I wonder whether they've ever mapped that area. There has been a lot of detailed uh, groundwater mapping, but uh, we do know that most of the wells are very low production wells. So if we did chase the groundwater, we have to drop a lot of wells. And a lot of people think that, okay, the water is in the ground. A lot of that is because there is a tail layer. A lot of the Sunshine Coast is covered by a glacial hill. And it's actually surface water that hits and runs. When it comes back out, it's actually not groundwater coming up from the aquifer. So, uh, you know, I wish there was a lot of gushing wells out there, but our, our aquifer is very low production. But we will do an investigation. Jason Herbs from the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association. Um, naturally, we have a lot of trouble with any uh, pumping, uh, any uh, carbon based pumping that may be occurring up in the lakes. We also have a problem with the lake being drawn down or the lake being elevated. Um, none of these are, as we see it, perfect solutions. Some are better than others. Um, we certainly, I'd like to hear a little bit more about a siphon system if we're going to draw that lake down. Uh, I think there may be less trouble with that. However, I think we have to go to uh, a lot more conservation measures. Uh, you use intensive uh, management of the water, but I think I don't remember all your cities, but I think all your cities were over the west coast, were they? Or, okay, so we're not talking comparisons with Germany, Switzerland, any other communities, even in the prairies or anywhere else, where water consumption, I suspect, would be considerably less per day per person than what we're dealing with already. So water harvesting or water use has to be addressed and can address these issues more, far more than what we're talking about just in looking at you know, delta with water meeting and metering in these other places. As a vicinity, as a part of the world, we are using way more water than we need to use because we have the water. Okay, well, we don't have the water, actually, in the summer. So we have to change our ways and come up with different methodologies for doing that. Simply going, we'll make the lake bigger, we'll pump it deeper so that we can all continue watering our gardens, washing our cars, washing our driveways is not a viable option. At this point, we have several communities, three different three different levels of government on the coast. As far as I know, there is no interrelationship or restrictions. If Seashell decides to build a huge subdivision up here, they say, top nookie, the SCRD supplies the water. It's not our responsibility. So that tells me that there isn't a proper 
value or restriction put on the water, such as the DCC you mentioned, uh, that addresses water and so those sidewalks and anything else where new subdivision is occurring, we have to look at that and so that the communities are balanced. Roberts Creek is going to be paying the same amount of water. Uh, it's going to be driven up in cost because of a delta development that may be occurring in Seashell, which drives up the overall demand on the coast. So there is an interrelationship between these we have to look at. Um, we have to start, I think, from the government level, municipal government level, and excuse me, local government level, looking at our BC building code and start talking to these guys about how we deal better with water harvesting. At the present time, uh, the complexity or even the non-allowance of water harvesting to be utilized within the house, even for something such as black water into your toilet, which is a non-pressure vessel, it's a gravity feed vessel. You can recharge your toilet from a water collection system. It doesn't go into your potable water system if you do it correctly. Uh, but the, right now, it's, it's very complex and I believe not even particularly encouraged. We have to go there if we want to talk about some of these things. We can't keep eliminating those options. So, um, what else have I got here? Uh, I think that's the main thing. But we have to put values on our biodiversity, on our natural environment, and we can't just keep assuming that we can make it bigger, better, engineer it, larger, and have more water. We have to consider our use of that water. Yeah. And at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about how uh, the regional sustainability plan is an overarching uh, vision that we're trying to obtain, and how this we try to align all the values in our, in our we envision document, which is the sustainability plan, into this as well. So, yeah, definitely conservation is close to our heart, and we want to uh, uh, pursue that as, as, as hard as we can. Metering is a key component of that, and but it, as well, it, it's not the silver bullet. We will all have to uh, build some infrastructure in order to meet our 25 year demands. Um, so what we're trying to do is uh, basically take as much, build as much conservation in, um, but as well try to be as sensitive as we can with our infrastructure. And that's why we're showing the floating pump station as an interim measure. Uh, we feel that the risk of an interim pump station is a lot lower and flying pumps up there on an emergency basis. So as an interim measure, get that so that we can get through those severe droughts. And uh, our operators, uh, we were up at that lake continuously, and we were, uh, we were very scared that we were going to run out of water. And uh, very scared that what? We we're going to run out of water last, uh, last fall. And uh, so, uh, the floating pump station will get us through those types of situations until we can actually build an engineer lake. An engineer lake, we feel, will be the ultimate. It's just a matter of securing the land, getting that built, it's going to take time. So, until we can do that, the intern pump station, um, or something similar that could actually get to uh, 10 feet more in that lake, uh, uh, we'd really like to pursue that just to get us over that. Good job. Good job. Thank you very much. I think both. Oh, yeah.
producing more, more water for fish than for human consumption thus uh, during that growth period. And you did mention there was funding to upgrade the quality of the water. Was that for
Two quick comments on the meeting. Always have a microphone. Yes. Always. Yes. Cannot go to a room with an audience without a microphone. Bad to stay, even if it's a little portable. Yeah, there, there, there actually is one in that room. Where is one there? Remote area. Yeah. Um, and the second one is the 15th or the May 15th deadline. It's pretty quick. It's a pretty big document if you want to assess it properly. Um, I would like to think that we could manage to squeeze a little bit more time for the public to deal with. But thank you. Glad to. Um, I spoke to a number of people who thought this was just an open house to kind of look at information at myself. I, I believe that. It didn't say anywhere that there would be, that I read, that there would be a presentation that would last a certain length of time. And obviously I, I'd missed it, the most of it. Um, that's another thing to think about when you're inviting the public to come to specify that it's, uh, you know, that there's someone will be speaking. Yeah, I'm pretty sure our all-around said that there will be a presentation right after we started. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, so I'm, I'm involved. I'm <laughs> sorry, but that will make it more clear. <laughs> the, whole, the whole presentation will be on YouTube as well, on the oh, SCRD yeah. YouTube oh, channel. Great. As okay. long as our camera works, it will be on uh, our YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor. We're here for.